now we take a look at the book, the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon, page 543 in your, your pew Bibles. First chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow the tracks of the flock and pasture your kids beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are comely with ornaments, your neck with strings of pearls. In chapter 2, verses 8 through 13, the voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. And now, for now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a funny story about my wife, Monica, and I do have her permission to tell this. There was an elderly woman glancing over her shoulder during a worship service, and there, young Monica and her dear friend Melanie were sitting, reading an open Bible with eyes the size of saucers. They were reading portions of the Song of Songs, but they started to feel something barreling down on them, and it was the eyes of this elderly woman. And as soon as they looked over to see that she was staring at them, they slammed that book shut, Look straight forward, eyes directly in front of them. As precocious young girls, they were captivated with the song of Solomon's daring, erotic, and intimate secrets, all the while thinking it was naughty for them to even be reading it. And of course, growing up in small town Iowa, where everybody kind of knows everybody, they didn't want anyone to get the wrong idea. Elusive to most, the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs is rarely preached on. Just to give you an idea, in the lectionary, which is a three-year cycle, this passage only comes up once. When was the last time you read this book? Ever? Years? I think it's rarely preached on because these poems are based on a secret song between two lovers. Here we witness the whispers of intimacy, the shouts of ecstasy, and the silences of consummation. <laughs> and we can't help but feel as though we're eavesdropping as we enter into such a private human experience. Maybe this is why there's a Jewish tradition that says no one should really read this book until they're at least 30 years of age. Now, interestingly enough, Song of Songs, as I mentioned in the New Testament, we have no idea who used this for devotional material, who had memorized these passages and shared them openly with one another. And you think about it, it's just not a popular book in Christian circles. And when I went to Baker Bookhouse but a month ago, I went to their use section and their commentary section, and I couldn't help but notice there they only had two copies on this. Very few people want to write about it, talk about it, except for maybe Hall of Fame broadcaster Ernie Harwell, the voice of Tigers baseball for 42 years. At the opening of each season, he'd recite the Song of the Turtle, and this is how I'm going to try to do it. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Ah, it's not even close to Ernie Harwell. But you wonder how many people listening to the opening of Tiger's Baseball had any clue that he is quoting the Word of God. How cool. 
is that. I think there's another reason why this book often gets ignored in Christian circles and from pulpits is that God is never mentioned once. How could that possibly be? God never speaks. God's never spoken to. The dialogue is presumably between two lovers. There are 117 verses. In 67 of them, she speaks. In 42 of them, he speaks. She gets the first word. She gets the last word. Her voice is prominent here. She's active, not passive. And there's no indication whatsoever of male dominance or female submission or any stereotype of either sex. So Song of Songs is situated in the cut to veem section of Hebrew scripture known as the writings. And so you've got poetical books like the Psalms, Proverbs, and uh, Job. And then there are other books like Ruth, Lamentations, um, Esther, Ecclesiastes. And you think about the title, Song of Solomon, which is often called the Song of Songs, it's, it's reminiscent to King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Heaven of Heavens, Holy of Holies. We're given the impression that there is a supreme song to be sung. What is it? What is that song? Well, it's not Tina Turner's song, What's Love Got to Do With It? Even though it's a good one, if you like Tina Turner. But I have a thought on this, and that is, if the book of Job is the cry of the Spirit, and the books of the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are all the cry of the human soul, then the book Song of Songs is preeminently the cry of the body in its essential yearning. And what is the essential yearning of the body? For love. For love. The theme of this book is love. This is the supreme song to be sung. It is an Eastern love song, a revelation of all that was intended in the divinely given function that we call sex. But even more than that, it is sex as God intended it to be, involving not just a physical activity, but the whole nature of humankind. And you know, Sigmund Freud used to say that sex permeates everything. And he's definitely right about that, was right about that. But sexual response and impulse touches us more than physically. It also touches us emotionally and spiritually. The, the, the way God made us. We are sexual beings. But it's more than just physical. It's everything. It's emotional. It is very spiritual. Song of Songs comes to us in what we might call a musical play form. The characters in the, in the play are Solomon, the young king of Israel. And it's written in the beginning of his reign and all the beauty of his youth. And the Shulamite, she's the simple country girl of unusual loveliness who fell in love with the king when he was ostensibly disguised as a shepherd working in one of his own vineyards in the north of Israel. Now let's just assume for a moment that the book of Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. According to tradition, he undertook expeditions to discover what life was like on various levels. And once he disguised himself as a simple country uh, shepherd. And in that state, he met this young lady. And it was love at first sight. Wow, she was beautiful. Wow, they hit it off immediately. The conversation couldn't have gone better, and they fell in love instantly. And then he goes away. She's sad about that, and she cries out for this young shepherd man who has captured her heart. And she cries out in her loneliness. She cries out in her desperation to see him once again and then comes the announcement that the king is coming to visit this valley and she's interested she thinks that's really great but her heart is with her lover and then when she hears that the king wants to meet with her specifically she's curious 
And when he walks into the room and discovers that the king is actually the shepherd, well, takes her breath away. And they go off to Jerusalem and they're married in the palace. So that's where this musical play is set, is in Jerusalem, in the capital of Israel. And then there's a chorus of singers referred to as the daughters of Jerusalem. They ask certain leading questions from time to time during the account of the events leading up to the courtship, the betrothal, and the marriage. A Shulamite girl addresses them on three occasions. And it's interesting to note that the word Shulamite is actually the feminine form of Solomon. So you might say this is Mrs. Solomon. It's possible. She's the bride. And we read of her encounter with this young man, their courtship and the strength and the methods and the delights of the supreme song to be sung. And that is the song of love. Love. So the book simply treasures love between two humans and does not seek to infuse a greater meaning into this joyous experience. This love is strikingly physical. The lovers speak frankly of caressing and lovemaking, something we don't talk about in church. <laughs> in fact, when the woman declares in chapters uh, chapter 1, verse 2, your love is more delightful than wine, the love of which she speaks is a Hebrew word which refers specifically to physical expressions of intimacy and a sexual relationship between her and her lover. Yes, 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 it's intimate. And that word love is where we often get in trouble because whereas the Hebrew word for love is specific in the English, we have multiple uh, definitions for what love could be. We say often, oh gosh, I love New York. Oh, I love your shoes. Duncan, I love your bow tie. It looks great. You know, I love the TV show America's Got Talent. We throw that word around often, frivolously. And then at night, we sit down with our, our child or with our nephew or with a grandchild and we, we kiss them on the cheek or on the forehead and we say to them, I love you so much. And for others, the same word is used when they make love at the end of a day. It's probably no surprise that there are dramatic interpretations of what this book may be trying to communicate to the modern reader. Questions abound. Is this allegorical? Is it dramatic? Is it cultic? Is it literal? How are we supposed to interpret this? Is the book an allegory of God's love for the Israelites with whom God has made a sacred covenant? Some Christians have interpreted it as describing the covenantal love of Christ for his church. In medieval mysticism, the Song of Solomon was construed to apply to the love between Christ and the human soul, which I think is, is a real stretch. But probably the view that has gained the most credence among modern scholars is simply that there are, it's a collection of secular love poems without any religious implications whatsoever. Simply put, the songs celebrate the joy and goodness of human love between the sexes and in the sense of inner fulfillment and harmony with God's creation that arise from such love. Now, if you know anything about the Greeks, they had multiple words for love. There was eros, phileo, and agape. Eros is the physical love. Phileo is the brotherly love. And agape is the unconditional love. It's usually referred to as the love of God. Um, but in our English translation of the Bible, these words all simply are translated as love. Love. But perhaps these loves are not so vastly different from one another. Perhaps they are merely three beautiful facets of the same gem. So let's go back to Genesis just for a moment. Let's go back to the beginning when there was absolutely nothing. Nothing. Dark. Dark. No light, no land, no water, no life whatsoever. And then miraculously, lights appear in the sky. Stars are scattered throughout the universe. Oceans of blue are divided by land. Animals pop up in jungles and plains and sea. Birds soar. 
And each day, there's the voice of the Holy One of God, the creator of all things, saying, it was good. It's good. And then comes the pinnacle of creation. God created humankind in its own image, male and female. He created them, and God said, be fruitful and multiply. And now the course becomes, and behold, God saw everything he made, and behold, it was very good. Wow. In other words, the, as the Bible sees it, humans are good in their sexual nature, no less than their spirit, because humans in their totality are created in the Imago Dei, the image of God. And God is wholly good. This is eros. This is the love embodied in, in, in physical form. And it's just one facet of the gem because later there will be other loves, the love between family members and friends. And every time we show unconditional love, we are showing the love of God. But perhaps yet another reason why we avoid speaking about the Song of Songs in our circles and in the pulpit is because we have long been convinced that sex is bad. If you ever read Frederick Beekner, the book, The Hungering Dark, he diagnoses the problem as this. The sexual ethic of our Puritan and Victorian forebears tended to look on sexuality as a dark and dangerous beast to be kept in chains, except within the context of marriage, and even there to be endured rather than enjoyed. It was repressive and unrealistic and hedged around with taboos. And in most ways, Buechner says, I believe we are well rid of it, but the tragedy is that no new understanding of sexuality has developed, and as a result, it's a kind of psychological and emotional chaos. Indeed, the public arena, we have loosed ourselves of all sexual restraints. The fear of pregnancy is relieved by modern methods of birth control, or worse yet, abortion. Anyone curious enough is readily able to find pornography on their cell phone or on their computer in the privacy of their home on the internet. Movies, TV, sitcoms, and songs on the radio make love and sex seem completely synonymous. And so our teens go out looking for love and come back with broken hearts when sex doesn't fill that void. So Beekner. Frederick Beekner, the retired Presbyterian minister, concludes in The Hungering Dark, our society is filled with people for whom the sexual relationship is one where body meets body, but where person fails to meet person. Song of Songs has so much to say about physical love, but it does not leave out the necessity of emotional intimacy. And that's something we all need. That's why right now as I speak to you in Afghanistan, there are countless families trying to get their loved ones out of there because the Taliban are Stone Age men psychopaths who have thought up that they're like somehow, they've got the answer to the truth. But what they do is they offer public executions, beheadings without a trial. They rape young girls. They destroy families. And they force marriages. Is it any wonder why folks are trying to get out of that country? And rapidly. Because once the deadline comes and goes, there is no saying what's going to happen to these folks. Americans, Afghans, the Chinese, the Russians, all folks who are still there who want nothing to do with the Taliban or any of their terrorists' uh, ideas. It is more than physical. It is emotional, this love. It is spiritual. C.S. Lewis put it, puts it this way. He says, we are born helpless and soon as we are fully conscious, we discover loneliness. We need others physically, emotionally, intellectually. We need them if we are to know anything, even ourselves. We have all experienced this need over the last year of social distancing. 
and in many cases, periods of long isolation. But I think what Song of Songs illustrates better than anything else is the beauty of love expressed between two people and that doesn't necessarily need to involve sexual intimacy. If we truly believe that God created the world and everything in it, then God certainly created us with the capacity to love as God loves. And this is agape. This is what we are called to do as, as Christians. With everyone, everywhere. It is godly love that sees the heart within the body. It sees the beauty of the person first in their character before their stature. It's another facet of the love gem when Jesus quoted Deuteronomy, as we heard earlier, when Ellen shared the assurance and Leviticus to his disciples saying, love God with your whole heart, love neighbor as yourself, he really meant it. He meant it. He said that this type of love would prompt anyone to lay down their life for their friends. We see the same intensity in the Song of Songs. It's a sacrificial love. It springs forth from the depth of the human heart, a heart that knows what true sacrificial love can look like. And later in the book, the woman captures the essence of this mystery when she says, set me as a seal upon your heart, for love is as strong as death. Passion as fierce as the grave. And as followers of Christ, even today, we have felt this love. We remember the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are overwhelmed by that example because that example reminds us again and again that love has no boundaries. The cross of Christ is scandalous. The idea that Jesus would love any one of us as much as he would love a member of the Taliban is scandalous. In 1 John, we read, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And so this is where, right here, love becomes more delightful than wine and as strong as death because the need for it in our daily lives is really the need to become fully human, human as we were made to be. When we lay down our lives for our friends, we not only give life to our friends, but we discover it for ourselves. That's the selfless love of agape love that we need and God desires for us to give to others. The song of love then, the supreme song, the one we should be singing from the rooftops, is the desire to be wholly loved and the impulse to be one with each other and ultimately one with God. And that's why this is good news and that's why the Song of Songs is in the canon and that's why we should read it and study it, celebrate it, and live it every day. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you Thank you for these words that are so unique, but ones that are true and can be trusted. Thank you for love in its many forms, but mostly for loving us with a love that knows no bounds, a love that helps us to see that we are cared for physically, emotionally, and spiritually by you that you're nurturing that love in us as we go about our lives only so that we can model and display this same love for those who need it most. Thank you for allowing us to eavesdrop on this moment of love between two people who remind us again and again that you designed us to be this way, to be close to one another to share love in all of its beauty and glory 
whether physically or emotionally or spiritually, but that we do it together. And above all, thank you for Jesus, whose love for us has inspired generations to serve him, to champion his message, and to bring about his unconditional love to those who desperately need a new lease on life. That's all of us. So God, may the words that we have heard this day be so grafted within our hearts that they bring forth in us the fruits of your spirit to the honor and praise of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord and all God's people say, Amen.